going to have to stir it up again, but uh, it's good to see you. Open your Bibles to the book of Jude, the book of Jude. The book of Jude deal, deals a lot with a warning of people that was going to be apostates. We find in looking at history, a lot of uh, ages ends in apostasy. And ending in apostasy, many times uh, there are several things play a key role, even homosexuality. That's why there's a great danger whenever you begin to pass laws and accept it. I noticed uh, this last week uh, they made a big hoodoo about the Pope recognizing uh, uh, unions. He said he wouldn't go as far as recognize marriage, but he, uh, he wanted to let his church uh, know that they were to uh, recognize uh, the unions of homosexuals. But someday he's going to figure out uh, he, you know, he claims, he, he claims right now to be the substitute of Christ. But someday when he meets Christ, he's going to find out he had, didn't have that authority. And so when he does, he'll find out that his, his voice is not equal to Scripture. And he'll find out that his, uh, uh, his laws does not mean it's God's law. And so therefore, uh, he can say what he wants to. But it just shows apostasy. And it shows apostasy in the end time. We need to be very careful. You know, everywhere we turn, there was a time, and I mentioned this before, even looking at the Roman Catholic religion. There was a time when John Kennedy ran for president that people in the, in the nation didn't think that it would be possible for a Catholic to be voted in. Now, they dominate everything in America. If you look at the House of Congress, they dominate. You look at the Senate, they dominate. And you look uh, at even at the uh, uh, Supreme Court, they dominate. And you also look, they even have the ability to sit uh, on the uh, 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 the nations, I can't think what I want. What? UN. Yeah, the UN, United Nations, and uh, they they have a seat there. We have a Christian school here. We uh, we do without any funds, public funding of any kind, and yet their schools receive funding from the government to fund their schools. And it's amazing how that we say something, they whine and cry, separation of church and state. And yet they can be recognized and receive uh, state and federal funds. But anyway, getting back to this, I'm afraid that people's not recognizing the great danger of apostasy. Jude was not only writing about apostasy in his time, he was also writing about it in the time to come, the latter days. We need to be prepared for it. <coughs> <coughs> There's a lot of churches swept away because they allow people to come into their church teaching things that should never have been taught. Now, you look at some of these liberal uh, dictionaries and you'll find apostasy is de or defined as, as a rejection of Christianity after someone has been a Christian. But that's not how God defines it here. He says these men are ungodly, uh, ungodly men. That means they live without God. He says they also turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. And so therefore we know that they also deny the only Lord Jesus, uh, their God, and uh, or, uh, only Lord God and uh, Lord Jesus Christ. And so we know that these are people that are not saved People. But begin reading with me, if you would, to, in the book of Jude. And I want to point out a few things, if you don't mind. Now, as I said, apostasy was prevalent in Judas's time. 
The spirit of Antichrist was present as well. John wrote about it. It's going to even get more prevalent. Paul writes that just before the church is taken, that the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist is going to be great. There's going to be a revolt against truth as we preach this morning. Then when the church is taken, the man of sin will be revealed and the removal of the restrainer, which is the Holy Ghost, keeping things in order. Somebody said, man, things are wicked. Imagine what it's going to be when the Holy Ghost is removed from this country and this world. Imagine what the world's going to turn into and the man of sin pops his head out into the scene. But anyway, Jesus also forewarned that there would be false prophets. Also, Peter said that there would be false teachers. And Paul said they'd be great falling away. So we need to be ready for that and don't need to be surprised when we see that going on all about us and all around us. So let's begin reading, if you would, in Jude, verse number 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, brother of James, to them that are sanctified by, uh, by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old uh, ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he reserved in everlasting chains of darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and, and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Listen, if I didn't have any other verse in the Bible to weigh me aw away from homosexuality, that one would. Because he makes it plain that they are an example to you and to the world of, of suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And unless you want to face that, you better wake up. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel, uh, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuked thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally is brute beasts, and those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, ran greedily after the heir of Balaam and, uh, for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. These are spots in your feasts of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruits withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out name, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own lust, these be they who separate themselves sensual, uh, having not the spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, 
And if some have compassion making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, even, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Now to him that is able to keep you from falling and to prevent you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Now, <clears throat> let's look a little bit. We want to look at these apostates. Now, apostate is someone who, who defects, departs, uh, revolts, rebels against uh, will for God. Uh, God. Uh, it's unbelief, it's not ignorance that they're doing this. They're willfully rebelling against truth. And so therefore what they do is they hold upon truths that they develop and des design themselves. We're going to look at some of those things here in just a moment. But let's look just a minute, if you would, in verse 1 and 2. Verse 1 and 2, we find the privilege of saints. Now let me say this. As long as there is saints here upon this earth, Satan is going to come after it. Now, you learn something about Satan when you study the Bible. Satan is not the original, uh, 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 original with anything. He is always an uh, uh, imitator. He wants to imitate God. The whole reason why he was cast out of heaven is because he was jealous of the glory of God. He wanted to ex exalt his throne above God's throne. He wanted to be worshipped like God. And so, therefore, he was cast out of heaven. Now, he, and not only he, but also in Revelation chapter 12, we're told that a third of the stars was cast out with him. In other words, a third of the angels. And here the Bible refers to Michael in verse number 9, Michael the archangel, battling with uh, Satan over the body of Jesus. Now we know there were three prominent angels in heaven, and probably each of them had a third of the uh, angels under their dominion, and that is Michael, that is Gabriel, and Lucifer. And of course Lucifer was cast out along with his, the other angels that fell with him. Now... Speaking of that just a moment, I want you to understand that the devil is jealous of everything that God has. His, his ambition is to do anything to take away from the glory of God. <clears throat> that is, if he can destroy you, if he can take down this church, whatever he can do, <clears throat> he loves to do. If he can misguide people, hide their eyes from the truth of the gospel, and yet make them think that they're saved, he will do that. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, he says, in that day, that's a day of judgment, many shall say unto me, Lord, Lord, we not prophesy in thy name, cast out devils, and do many wonderful works. He said, depart from me, you work of iniquity, I never knew you. Now what was going on with all these people that was prophesying, casting out devils and doing miracles or thinking they were doing miracles. The devil had deceived them into believing that they were being used of God when they weren't being used of God at all. They were deceived. And the reason why is because they rebelled against God. And let's look at some things the Bible talks about real quickly. That's a privilege of being saved. He, he separates us out. In verse number 1, he said they are sanctified by God the Father. In other words, anybody who has been truly saved has been set apart by God the Father. You have been born again, set apart, you are sanctified. Now, sanctification is, is three, different, uh, three different phases in your life, but sanctification, when you get saved, you are set apart eternally for God. Once you've been set apart, you become his, and no man is able to pluck you out of his hand. Now, not only are you sanctified by God and set apart, you are preserved in Jesus Christ. In other words, somebody said, well, preacher, I can't see how I can claim to be eternally saved when I know myself. Well, when we know ourselves, then we have to uh, understand that our salvation does not rest in ourselves. We are preserved 
in Jesus. As long as Jesus remains sinless, as long as Jesus remained pleasing to the Father, as long as Jesus is acceptable sacrifice, and he has, and the Bible says he was, uh, that it was a son in whom he was well pleased, and so therefore he is perfectly accepted in God's eyes, and we are accepted through Jesus Christ. Therefore we are preserved in Jesus Christ. We are saved by grace through faith. But we are preserved by Jesus. We are kept by a power greater than ourselves. Peter says we are kept by the power of God. And by the way, let me say this. The Bible says the moment you got born again of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God lives within you. He abides with you, and he will be with you forever, and he will be sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. You are redeemed. Your body is redeemed. But what you need to understand is this. We, uh, we dealt in, in, in church the other day, we dealt with the fact of, uh, of some being, uh, uh, <coughs> thank you, I've had a sore throat. My throat's kind of getting scratchy, so I'll, I might have to use that before the night's uh, out. But anyway, uh, let's, uh, uh, when, when you get thinking about it, the Bible teaches and Jesus taught that before the strong man can be cast out of the house, then a stronger man has to come and cast him out. I'm glad to say God lives within me. Now, whoever wants to come and pick on God and cast him out of me, you just come ahead and try. Somebody say, well, I'm afraid of being possessed by the devil. I'm not anymore. I don't worry about it. I don't lose one ounce of sleep. You know why? It is impossible to have demons to come into my body. Amen. It is impossible to be possessed by the devil. You know why? I have a stronger than the devil living within me. And so if they're going to come in, they're going to have to cast the Holy Ghost out. And uh, that's a battle they don't want to pick because they know that they're no match for the Lord. Uh, and you find that whenever they confronted Jesus several times upon his ministry. So therefore, we are not only sanctified by God, we're preserved by Jesus Christ, and also we are called, in verse number one, we are called by God himself. Each of us, if you've ever been saved, you've been called by God. He knows you, he's called you, and he's drawn you to come to him. And those of us who have obeyed, we have received salvation. He says in verse number three, that he thought to write of us of the common salvation. The common salvation does not mean some cheap salvation. It does not mean some, something that's just uh, is so, uh, so uh, uh, plenteous that uh, it's not worth or valued of anything. It means that everybody that's saved got saved the same way. Now you might be in, some of you might be in a field, some of you might be in church, some of you might be in a home at night, some of you might be in your living room floor. That's not what I mean. I mean that if you got saved, you got saved by the same way. You got saved by coming to God through Jesus Christ, putting your faith and trust in him, repentance toward God, faith in Jesus Christ. And then putting, uh, when you exercise that faith and repentance, God saved your soul when you call upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And so therefore we have a common salvation. We have the same common spirit that lives within us. We have the same witness and we have the same testimony. Each of us has to give the same testimony. We were sinners saved by the grace of God. And somebody said, what are you now? I am what I am by the grace of God. I am a sinner saved by the grace of God still, amen? We bear the same testimony. Now look, if you would, in verse number three, the last part. We that are saved, we have to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to us. And so therefore, what we have to do is, we have to understand that they're going to come after our faith. Faith is the word of God teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Therefore, the word of God, our faith, we have to come and we have to stand and we have to stand against those who will come and contend against his faith. And my friend, it's going to get violent as, as the closer coming of, of the Antichrist, the more violent and more hatred is going to be. 
I, 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 I'm, I stand amazed at the hatred expressed, openly hatred expressed of our president. The uh, expressed uh, uh, hatred of the liberals, the expressed hatred of many politicians, and those that, you know, the ones that hates them are those who've made a living off of being politicians. And also the hatred of the press. Uh, and, and they hate him to such a degree that they're willing to destroy themselves by showing that they are obviously biased in everything they say and do. Now, but, but you think the hatred of Donald Trump is bad. And by the way, Donald Trump's not a perfect guy by no means. And some, some storms he brings on himself. But the point being is, I, I really think he's got America at heart, but getting beyond politics of it, I'm talking about Jesus. And the Antichrist, he wants to defame Jesus. And anything he can do to take away from the true teaching and preaching of the gospel to see people saved, he wants to do that. And so we have to fight a battle to keep the faith alive. Now look on, if you would. We see problems of these apostates popping up uh, after verse 3. As I said in verese four, 4, there are certain men unawares who were uh, before uh, of old ordained. In other words, they were foretold. Peter says that they will, in, in chapter 3 of 2 Peter, that they will come, scoffers will come at the last days. They will deny the creation that God created the world. Guess what? <laughs> welcome, to, welcome to our educational system. Uh, did you ever see such a, 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 such a thing being pushed on our educational system? and trying to change history and everything else in there. It's amazing sometimes. And they're going, they're going to revile the thought that there was a flood. And they're going to repudiate that the fact that they're going to be judgment of God and the wrath of God, uh, these people are. The Bible says they're ungodly men. Uh, they, they're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. That means a license to sin. In other words, they're claiming that, uh, that you, can, you can have a relationship with God and any lifestyle you want to live. Do anything you want to do. You have a license to sin any way you want to uh, because of God and who God is. But that's not what the grace of God is. And the Bible says that these are ungodly men turning the grace of God into a license to sin or lasciviousness. Also, it says denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Both places where it used the word Lord it is talking about Ananias. Uh, and Ananias is one of the uh, uh, three primary names of God, uh, Jehovah, Elohim, and Ananias. And when you see Lord spelt this way, it's talking about a Ananias. It means that he is master, and we have to come to him in a submissive way, and we have to come submissively recognizing that he is our master. Now listen to me. Did you ever notice in the Bible, everywhere where it talked about you coming, calling upon the name of the Lord, it was Ananias? Did you ever notice that the Bible says God gives grace unto the what? Huh? Humble. You know why it's a humble? Because when you get saved, somebody said, well, I want to get saved, I want to go to heaven, but I'm going to do it my way. No, you're not. Somebody said, I'm not humble myself. You'll not be saved. If you're going to be saved, you got to humble yourself. And so what happens is, when we humble ourselves, our humility brings the grace of God into our life because we recognize him as Lord. And we call upon the name of the Lord. And so therefore, the Bible says, not these guys. They want to have religion, but they don't want to have him as Lord. They're not going to have him as their master. They're going to control their own way. And so they openly rebel against God. He gives six examples here and illustrations in the Bible. Notice what he does. First of all, he gives the illustration in verse number five of Israel. And Israel rebelled uh, against uh, the, the provisions of God. And remember that he sent Israel into the promised land and showed them the land of milk and honey, but they didn't believe him. 
And through their unbelief, they had to go around 40 years and they died in the wilderness. The Bible said they died there because of their unbelief. They openly rebelled against the provisions that God had made for them. And so therefore, uh, they died in that situation. Also in verse number 6, he gives the examples of angels. Angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness until the judgment of the great day. Now, I'm not going to get into this tonight, but there are some fallen angels that works as demons with the devil, that possesses people. Then there's some that's been reserved uh, in, in chains already. And we'll talk about that another time, but not tonight. But the point I want you to see is that the angels, they rebelled against the authority of God. And so when they re rejected the authority of God and followed Lucifer, they were cast out of heaven. Also, he gives the example, number seven, of Sodom. Sodom re uh, uh, rebelled against the commandments of God. And so therefore, uh, they, they uh, rejected God and they rejected, rejected the warnings of God. And they not only gave themselves over to fornication, they gave themselves over to strange flesh. And... Uh, and the Bible says, as we read before, they were an example of the suffering and vengeance of eternal fire. Not only that, but he also gives the, the example of Cain in verse number 11. Now Cain openly rebelled against the authority of God in salvation. He tried to have religion without blood. He thought he could worship God without a blood sacrifice. Well, he openly rebelled against the commandments of God in salvation. And so therefore, he's given as example, and also you find in, that Balaam was given as example. He rebelled against the authority of God in separation. He was commanded to be separate from Moab and the Moabites, but he rejected that, and he tried to have a religion without the supernatural. And so he thought he could do that. Then also we have Korah. Remember Korah? He's opposed himself against God's authority in service. In other words, he rejected Moses being his mediator between him and God. And so when he rejected that, he tried to have a religion without a mediator. And therefore, he was considered an apostate as well. As a matter of fact, the earth opened up and swallowed him down into hell. And so it swallowed him right up. Uh, the reason why? He was apostate. He rejected and rebelled, uh, not unwillingly, they willingly rejected and rebelled against what God would have them to do. Now, when we do that, we find that they reject, these apostates, they reject divine authority. And so the Bible says here, if you look back in your Bibles, in verse number 8, that the cause of the rebellion is that they are filthy dreamers. In other words, they have imagination of what they want to do. Now, now, people say, well, do we see any apostates now? Listen to me. This religious world is full of apostates. Amen. You want to see some? Sunday morning, flip your TV on and go through the channels. You'll see a whole bunch of them. They, are, they think of nobody but themselves. And they, they rebel against God and his teaching. And what they do is they create their own form of religion. And they, uh, they, they, uh, uh, they develop their religion to suit themselves. Most of them, if you notice, they have you sending the seed to them. Making them filthy rich. And promising you uh, that God's going to do something for you if you make them rich. And... Uh, I was watching some, one of them one day, uh, a reporter was trying to get him to explain why he had to have seven jet planes and all those mansions around the world. It was amazing to watch him try to explain that to her, how that God wanted him to have all those things. Show me that in the Bible. They are a bunch of apostates, and they're, they're leading people astray. And, and it's amazing. You look at them, and they go into these coliseums, and they go into these gymnasiums and arenas and so forth, and they fill them, and people go, and they make a mockery of things. But people that are ignorant, blind, follow after them.
That's why you need to study the scripture to rightfully divide the root, uh, word of God. I look at them and I see already uh, over their heads apostates, rebellions against God. And so therefore what we find is the cause of the rebellions are filthy dreamers. They dream about things that they want. And number two, their course is, look, look in verse number eight, they defile the flesh. They despise dominion. And they speak evil of dignities. And so therefore, they don't care a bit to do those things, and they resort to deliberate hypocrisy, such as Cain and Balaam and Korah did. And uh, then the Bible says their penalty in verse number 12, or 13, is they are reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Amen? So there is a pride of the apostates. If you look on down, he talks about they are worthless stones, withering trees, waterless clouds, wide, uh, wild waves, and wandering stars. And the Bible says even Enoch of old, seventh from Adam, he foretold that they were coming. They were going to be all around. You say, preacher, why? Why do you preach this? Please listen. Because these people in Jews' time and in our time are sneaking in in wolf's clothing, sheep's clothing, and they're wolves. And they're coming in, and then they get a control, and they don't care a bit to destroy whatever they destroy. Therefore, you've got to be wise into it. You've got to be, you've got to be knowledgeable about it. And you've got to know when you see these people coming, and listen, I don't care how well like you like somebody, even take myself. I believe most of you love me. I believe that. But let me say, if I get up here teaching you astray and you know my teachings are false, that's when you as a church need to stand up and say, no, we're not going to follow that. That's not truth. And you need to have the ability to do that instead of blindly letting someone lead you and destroy you and lead you down. These apostates are going to come and, and they're, going to be, they're going to be sly. You know, the devil, he dresses himself up as ministers of light. He don't come in here and, and he don't get in here cursing God. He's going to little by little take away everything that, that is, is, is meaningful in the gospel and the faith that we have that was once delivered unto us. He's going to tear it down and try to make a new way, uh, idea of coming to God. Now, notice if you would, uh, in verse number uh, 20, the Bible says, verse number 19 says, they, be, uh, they who separate themselves sensual, having not the spirit. So we know that they're not saved people. But then he leaves us a note, those of us who are saved. I'm going to close on this, but I want you to see it. He says that there's four things that we can do to help during this time and stay concentrated on. One is, look if you would, he says, 20, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keeping yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ and the eternal life, and if some have compassion, making a difference, others with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hanging him in the garment, spotted by the flesh, now unto him that's able to keep you from falling, present you faultless before the presence of his glory and seeing joy to the only wise God, our Savior, to be glory, majesty, dominion, power, both now and ever. Amen. So number one, he wants us to unite ourselves. Unite ourselves that we build ourselves up on our holy faith. We are to pray in the Holy Ghost of God, keep ourselves in the love of God, and looking for the mercy and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so therefore, we, we do that. Then also, we exercise compassion upon lost people, trying to save them with compassion, trying to lead them to Jesus Christ, and even going as far as trying to pull them out of the fire. Even though you might hate the, 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 the lifestyle that they live, you might hate what, what kind of saved, but we still want to see them saved. Listen, can you think of anybody that is so wicked that you earnestly would say that you would not like to see them get saved? You know, I've often thought when we've seen, when we've seen people that was just uh, uh, murderers and killers and, you know, working in the emergency service, I got to see a lot of things for 25 years. 
I've got to see child abuse. I've got to see children. Uh, uh, I've got to see them uh, uh, just tormented in ways and abused in ways, uh, uh, physically, sexually. I, I, I went to a little two-year-old girl one time that a, a, a woman's boyfriend had fed the baby battery acid uh, because it made him mad because he was crying and made him drink battery acid and made the little girl drink battery acid and it eat her lips off, eat a hole through her stomach. By the time we got there, it ate a hole through her stomach and she, uh, and she was about dead uh, because he was so cruel by making her drink that battery acid because she wouldn't shut up from crying. And, uh, and I've seen others where they've just beat them mercifully uh, and so forth and different issues. And boy, you get on scene, it's everything you can do. And then you get thinking about, you know, even as angry as I got with these people, I can't say that I'd want to see them die and go to hell. If there was a way of pulling them out and seeing them saved, I'd love to see them saved and turn their life over to Jesus Christ. Now, uh, to be saved. But now if they don't, they will stand and face the judgment of God. The next thing is that we have in verse 24, we have security in Christ. Therefore, we don't have to, we don't have to run around and be, be, be fearful. We know in who's keeping us and able to keep us. And number four and last in verse 25, we need to be submissive unto God. The Bible says that we are to, that we are to uh, resist the devil uh, the Bible says, draw near and nigh unto God, he'll draw nigh unto you. Resist the devil and he will flee from thee. Uh, and first it says that we are to submit ourselves unto God. And so therefore we need to learn to submit our keeping unto God. And uh, I know I went through this chapter really quick. And I hope that you're able to gain a little bit. But what I'm trying to get across to you is this. We are living in perilous times as we preach this morning because of the preaching of the word has gone aside and you have apostates coming in you have people coming in that just destroys the teachings of the bible and you have people destroying the faith that was once delivered to the saints and they begin to try to teach other ways and other means and you know i mean how is it you know we talk about homosexuality every age that ends in apostasy homosexuality plays a vital role how is it that these major denominations vote to allow homosexuals to be in their church membership, to be pastors and deacons of their church. And yet the world right now will crucify this message. And I'm going to tell you something. Had President Trump not got in and Hillary got in, continued what President Obama was doing? By this time, the fourth year into her, into her, minister, uh, her uh, presidency, it would probably be illegal to preach this. Especially if they come and they overthrow with numbers the Supreme Court with liberal people would uphold a ruling like that. Where will we stand when that time comes as churches? Imagine this. Imagine if, if, if uh, they, uh, Joe Biden gets, gets the presidency. Imagine if he overthrows the Supreme Court and throws numbers upon it to give liberals the votes to do whatever. You think those liberals that hates so full of hate are going to let us preach a message like this we're going to face all kinds of persecution if that happens and some people said preacher it don't matter Christians shouldn't get involved in, in voting are you crazy where did you ever learn such a thing as that if we don't vote who we depend upon putting our leaders in and what kind of leaders do you want? We got to be wise, folks. We are living in dangerous times. And we're being flooded in every direction with things to destroy that faith that was once uh, delivered into the saints. 
And the Bible says we have to contend to keep it alive. That means we have to have a fight and battle. And we just can't give up. Amen. Let's stand tonight. Maybe you're here tonight and God's still in your heart about something. But folks, we need to, we need to remember, and Jude was trying to get his, uh, his folks that he was writing to, to be sober about the dangers that lies within and all around us and how that they come and filtrated the, the churches. John wrote of them. Peter wrote of them. Jesus foretold of them. And... Uh, each one of them got to experience different ones in their lifetime. But uh, we need to be wise. Be wise. Amen. Brother Jesse.